Okay, thank you, Jess Fair. It's lovely, lovely to be invited and lovely to be part of it. I'm, I'm always been into the awe of science and of art. So uh, because of various sort of, you know, growing up things, uh, I ended up doing science. I was going to become a medical doctor. Uh, that didn't happen. But also whilst growing up, I was always drawing and a voracious reader. And after having sort of completed my scientific studies and still doing art in parallel, um, I realized what I really wanted to be was an artist. But obviously with that scientific background, it, it feeds into your work. You are as uh, you're all the dots of the stories that as the years have gone on, what's become very interesting is people kept saying to me, I mean, now the whole idea of combining art and science is very accepted, but it wasn't when I was doing it. I had to kind of keep them very separate and very secret. And then as the years have gone on, people kept saying to me, um, how do you think the way that you think? I went, well, I don't, I don't understand what you mean. How do I think the way that I think? And how do you connect all these seemingly unrelated ideas? So I realized there was, there was obviously a method. There was obviously something that I was doing. And I've also worked with children for 20 years. And I realized that children are the most creative until at some point somebody says, you don't want to do it like that. You want to do it like this. And uh, I guess for me, what I realized is that the art and the science, the creativity, the engineering, the way that you think, the buzz that you get when you're thinking is so addictive that actually lots of other things become almost meaningless. So in terms of materiality and, and uh, you just want to, to be in that place where you can have become the dopamine junkie, which is what I always say to my students. So for me, yes, art and science, but it's not so much these particular subjects. It's what happens in your mind when you're doing these things. I think that's the really important thing because I think that's the thing that can allow us to become much more self-aware and to transcend an awful lot of the problems that we currently have. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so for that state of mind to happen where we get that buzz, do you believe that there are certain places that are more conducive to being creative than others? For example, I know of your connection with Venice. Do you think that Venice is a place where every, everyone can be naturally more creative or do you think it depends on the person? I think it can happen anywhere. It is about opening your mind. It's about being aware of opportunities. So Venice is almost like the extreme polar. It's, it's, like a, it's almost like a Disneyland of architecture and light and color and materials. Um, but you don't need that in order to be creative. It's, it's strange, Jess, because it was only a couple of years ago. Because again, when you're, when you're practicing, when you're making, you don't really know. I'm at the stage now where I don't really know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I listen to my intuition. I don't think about it up here. And then I realized, of course, I'd grown up with the glass and the transparency and the colors and uh, the melting, if you like. And that was exactly what I was doing with my plastic. But I think it comes from looking. And, and, and this is where artists and scientists have, have they develop this, this skill to be able to notice things. So this is again, and I realized that also being outside, going for a walk, being amongst the trees, simply looking up and noticing the, the line of a leaf as it hits the blue sky. It's that sort of looking. So I don't think it matters where you are. I mean, I will get really inspired just watching a TV program. For example, I, I used to love Top Gear because for me it was, <clears throat> the most creative of things on TV it was all to do with cars, but it was the fact that they noticed different opportunities. The other thing, Jasmine, is that you know you are a unique combination of both science and art, and also you are recognised for being an artist. What I find is that so many brilliant artists they seem to lack this commercial awareness or this kind of lack of persuasion skills. How have you? manage to um, have your artwork recognized for how good it is? Uh, it's taken a very long time. So the very first thing I would say is resilience. But when I left my PhD, uh, when I finished, uh, I set up a consultancy with a friend and we were going into schools and we were doing outreach. And for me, it was a way, because obviously I had to earn my bread and butter. I had a small son. Uh, I had to make use of what I'd done as well. Um, so running a business at that time, I learned a great deal about the, it's wonderful when you create something new, but very often it's the boring, nitty gritty, everyday things that I think sometimes let people down. 
And I think, so that taught me a lot about running a business. I'm not a brilliant businesswoman, I wish I was. <laughs> um, for, as I say, for me, it was about the setting up. But what I realized was that A, it's perseverance. So you've got to follow things up. And also once my son was a little bit older, I started, I learned the power of networking. I never really understood the power of that. And I couldn't do it when he was young, but when he was older, I could go to networking events. And it wasn't so much about this word networking. You, you start to make friends. You start to meet like-minded people or people who are very different to you. And sometimes it results in work, sometimes it doesn't. So it's a multi-pronged thing. It's following up opportunities. It's creating opportunities. It's knocking on the door. I mean, the thing about art is you can't give up. You've just got to be resilient. Because um, for me, everyone says they want something innovative. You create something innovative and people don't know what to do with you. Um, and I think it's also about timing. I think my timing is coming right now. Um, sometimes you can be making things that uh, are ahead of the times. But now with this emphasis on innovation and creative thinking and obviously AI, I realize it's at the time. So this is why the resilience perseverance thing is so important. And you also have to be businesslike in that you have to deliver when you say you're going to deliver. You have to do what you say you're going to do. You have to, in, you have to do all those types of things that people imagine creative people don't do, but they do. They're very, very organized. They also allow for chaos. I have a lot of chaos, but I have a lot of very routine, organized parts of my day as well. Yeah, that's so, so interesting what you say about timing being so important, because if we look at the work of Van Gogh, for example, Van Gogh was very reclusive. He didn't have a lot of social skills, but maybe even if he did have very refined social skills, his artwork was ahead of the times. Maybe yes. the timing just wasn't right. So is there something that a creative person can do to you know, be persuasive regardless of the place they're in, regardless of, you know, is it just to do with resilience that they have to wait for to be in the right place at the right time? I think with any business, what I, what I realized is very difficult with art. If you look at any business, there's a model. Invariably, there's a model, there's a pipeline, there's a way of getting in front. Of, because people can, if people can understand their need for what you do, you can sell it. The problem with art, of course, is we really do need it. It's everywhere all the time. It feeds that, whatever that internal need that we have. It's the best part of what humanity is. But most people don't realize that they need it because they're surrounded by it all the time. They take it for granted. So communicating to uh, whether it's patrons or companies or, or even when you enter competitions or you do proposals, you have to communicate why they need what you're doing. So you have to find the language or, um, I don't know, you have to be able to answer the brief. But what's really important is you must not lose your own vision. And this is what can become so difficult um, you've got to think, this is my vision, this is what I want to make. I'm not going to change it to fit in with things, but how can I make other people aware that actually what I do does fit in with what they need? And I think that's a real skill and it takes quite a long, I mean, I'm still learning it, learning decks and proposals. And, and sometimes you think, yeah, I've really hit that because you do it, but it's communicating it. <clears throat> so that's the other thing I realized very much about being an artist now is I have to use a lot of words. I do an awful lot of writing. Um, and an awful lot of speaking and so you're asking a great deal from creative people in terms of um, we want you to be innovative we want you to be original we want you to be creative but you also have to do all this other stuff as well I mean and for me this is again when you look back at your life and you kind of think everything's disjointed and then you look back and you go actually now everything I've done has led to this point so all the teaching all the because obviously you know I used to panic like anything standing up in front of people and public speaking and I still get nervous about it but you get better at it and when you realize that actually it's really nice I've got you locked in a room and you have to listen to me talking about my work <laughs> um, that's a real privilege so it's something that becomes uh, you start to enjoy and of course you can get your message out to an awful lot more people doing that rather than hoping that people will passively see your work or engage with it online um, and I think it's part of a much bigger movement uh, although i make visual art it as i said before it's the thinking I, I i want everyone to be as enthusiastic about the thing that drives them as i am about the thing that drives me 
because we can change the world that way just yes and yourself being an academic uh, you know you you must be aware that there's a lot of interest now in public engagement so we're being encouraged to not just kind of work in silos but to think about how our work has an impact on the community how how it has an impact on society do you find that you know, using public engagement in your work, you know, are there challenges that you face in doing that? Yes, I, I'm sort of, I work with uh, Maureen Tangi and she is very much about changing the perception of art out in the public. What's challenging about doing public art is, uh, it's okay if it's a one-off, if it's a workshop, but if you're making something that has to be installed for a long time, there are a whole load, again, there's a whole load of other stuff like health and safety and the engineering of it. And, but um, the thing about public engagement as well, it was something that I was very passionate about when we were going into schools because I wanted to take the fear out of science. So I thought if we can get over this elitism, if you like, the, long, the use of long words, the use of difficult concepts, if we can just go, you know what, yes, a rainbow is incredibly complex, but you don't need to understand exactly how it's made to appreciate it you can get the majority of people to engage with arts because that's for me very it's very important at the moment i mean i remember when i used to take my son into galleries and, and he would whisper and i'd say to him why are you whispering it's an art gallery it's not a church right. so we have to get over this this um it's for everyone and that's really important because it brightens mm -hmm. everyone's day yes and i really share that you know that value with you about in a way democratizing are democratizing you know even conferences you know because yes. conferences in themselves can be very elitist because not everyone has it has easy access to them either you know because they don't they have family commitments they, they can't yes. travel they or maybe they don't have the finances especially if they are struggling artists yes. so yeah so this concept of democratizing is important but what i've noticed that is that in our culture we tend to find it a lot easier to fund projects that are scientific compared with projects that are, are you know based on art because it's much uh, much more difficult to prove that art has an impact whereas it's much easier to prove the tangible outcomes of science so how do we get over this this thing of like having to rely on tangible evidence for to prove to provide proof that we are causing an impact this is going to take time it's, it's interesting that you say this just because uh, I do quite a lot of this creativity stuff <laughs> and when I speak to some of the institutions they say yes but just this is brilliant but how do we measure it mm -hmm. how are we going to know you know basically how do you know that you've got value for money and I have to say but we can't I really genuinely can't tell you that you're going to get this particular benefit or not in the short term but from my experience after so many years of doing it um you know sometimes i get an email out of the blue from somebody who's suddenly gone off to college to do something and they never had an aspiration i've had emails from engineers who literally changed their lives overnight i know it works but it's this i guess we have to get away from the this sort of empirical science can be measured art can't and i i don't <laughs> i don't know that we can ever get away from that just i i think it's just it's something that you how do how do i put this once people have had that feel good thing once they've experienced uh, an old passion coming back once they've seen that i had for example one one engineer uh, I remember he came back into one of my classes and he said, Jasmine, I used to be really tired and I used to go home and I used to resent playing with my children, you know, building Lego. He said, but now that I understand it's part of my engineering practice, right, actually going and chilling out with my kids, it's improved how I am at work. So we just, we have to just keep, I guess, plugging on and showing people that it does, it changes you as an individual, but it's not something you can put measurement on. Yeah, and according to systems thinking, um, we can't measure, but we can map. You know, so the story, that anecdotal um, evidence like that, it can be used to map patterns. We see patterns emerging that are different, perhaps more life enhancing compared with 
um, you know, the tangible hard outcomes. That's so, a lovely way of putting it, life enhancing. I like mm -hmm. that. That's a really nice way of putting it. I, I wanted to say, first of all, it's brilliant that you're doing what you're doing. You. Uh, I have felt for years like I'm, um, so I've been so isolated in this, this doing the way that I do things and, and this type of thinking. And what's wonderful is when you start to connect with others and you think there are lots of kindred thinkers out there. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to find our resonance. We need to find, we need to amplify. We need to find our noise. So first of all, thank you for finding me and thank you for asking me to add to this. And I, I find this so exciting who we will connect with, who all that, because it, it can only happen through collaboration now. This is such a massive thing.